Hey guys, my name is Stephen. Thanks so much for joining us online today. We're going to start with some worship songs. We're going to have some fun. Here we go. Praise the name that 
service right now. Lord, thank you for what you've already done. Lord, use this recording, Lord. Use these songs. Use this message, Lord, to reach each and every person that's watching today, Father. Lord, I pray over Dwight's message, Lord. I pray that it's clear, Lord. I pray that it just speaks directly to the hearts of who needs to hear it. We pray all this in your name. Amen.
Hey, New Point, I trust that you're doing great. I want to welcome each and every one of you. Whether you're at one of our six campuses or whether you're joining us online, I am honored that you have chosen to join us today. Now, we're in this series called Under My Roof, and we're looking at the family. God created us to live in families. And so we've looked at the family, we, we've looked at marriage, and today we want to look at parenting. What an unbelievable, awesome responsibility, but also privilege, because here's what I know. No one has a greater potential to impact and influence a child than a dad or a mother. I, I mean, we have been given a great responsibility, but also a tremendous privilege to be able to do that. Now, what I've learned is this. Your kids are not going to be at home forever. I know that's the case with Patty and I. You know, we, we were blessed with four kids, Caleb, Sarah, Jonathan, and, and Benjamin, and they're basically all gone. They're all gone. They've, they've moved on, and it just seems like yesterday we were dropping them off for kindergarten, and now they're adults, and they're out on their own, and they're doing life, and you know, it makes me wonder, where did this time go? And maybe you're finding yourself in that position today. I want to share something with you that's sobering, all right? It's, it's what I would call under my roof timeline. And that is this. If you've just had a, a new baby, you got about 936 weeks with that little one. If you've dropped them off to kindergarten this year, you got about 676 weeks. If, if they went into the sixth grade, you ready for this, Mom? Dad? You got about 364 weeks. If they're in high school, if they've gone to high school, they're in ninth grade, you only have about 208 weeks with them. And if your son or daughter is in the 12th grade, you got less than 52 weeks now. Wow. How time flies. That's why Solomon says that there is a season for everything and that God makes everything beautiful in its time. And the season that we share as parents, we should never, ever, ever take for granted. Why? Because of this right here. You see, I don't know anyone who wakes up and says, you know, I just don't want to be a good parent. I, I, I want to be known as a bad parent, a poor parent. No, the fact of the matter is whenever you hold that little one, your desire is to be able to be a great parent and to be able to establish a strong family. But that's not the issue, is it? It's not our desire. The issue is when life begins to move at such an incredible pace that we don't choose to slow down. And so what happens is we, we don't choose to be that, that mother, that father, that God desires us to be. And the fact of the matter is if the pace that we live produces a constant pressure in your life and in my life as a mom or a dad, what happens? That pressure to, to have more and to get more and to produce more. Our families will always be at risk. Wouldn't you agree? because time goes so quick and so fast. And so people ask the question, you know, is it possible to achieve success and build a healthy family at the same time? Is it possible to, to raise faithful kids in our world today? You see, what we have to understand is the goal of parenting is not just to raise good moral kids who keeps your name out of the papers. The actual goal is to inspire them, train them, to love the Lord your God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind, and with all of their strength, because that's the key to life. You see, as, as a mother, as a father, you're not raising your kids for a temporary life here on earth. You're raising them to have a vibrant, growing, healthy relationship 
with the one who knitted them together in their mother's womb, who will never leave them, who will never forsake them, who will give them the strength, the courage, the hope to endure life's ever challenging trials and problems. See, you're raising them for something bigger. You're raising them for something eternal. I love what the psalmist has to say. He says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring, a reward from him. Wow, they're a gift to you and me. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Wow. Now notice that he didn't say, he didn't say that children are like swords in the hands of a warrior. Why? Because arrows were meant to be shot and to be sent into places that a warrior could never, ever go. You see, we're not raising kids to be extensions of ourselves. We're raising them to influence and impact and change their world in ways that you and I never could. You see, we're, we're raising kids for something bigger than the American dream. We're raising them to be and to experience eternal life. And so here's what we have to understand as parents, as moms and dads. When your child was born, I, 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 I know that, that you probably said the exact same thing that I said. You know what, there couldn't be a cuter baby. You know, they're so precious and they're so innocent. But the fact of the matter is, Scripture tells us that we were all born in sin. So they have a, a, a sin nature. They, they have a desire to do that which is wrong. They, they don't have a, a God nature in them. That's why we don't have to teach our kids to lie or steal or say hurtful things, do we? You know, I didn't tell my kids, hey, you know what? There's going to come a time of when mom says that you have to wait to eat a cookie. And so here's what I want you to do. I know there's going to come a time of when you're going to do that. And so when, when she approaches you and asks you whether you ate the cookie or not, I want you to look dead straight in her eyes. You can practice with me and just say, nope, I didn't eat it. No, we don't have to do that, do we? Absolutely not. That comes natural to them. We don't have to teach our kids to do that which is wrong. They're born with that sinful nature. They've not been born again of God's spirit. And so as a result, they need Jesus. They need to receive Jesus. They need to experience Jesus. They need to have a new heart so that they can have new desires. And they don't come knowing about God, theology about God. They don't know about sin. They don't know about its consequences. They don't know about God. They don't know about his truth. They don't know about his grace. They don't know about his presence. They don't know about his power. You see, all of these things, they need to be taught. They need to be trained in. That's why what happens under your roof is more important than what happens under any other roof because our children come not with the knowledge of these things. And, and so one of the greatest experiences that a mom or a dad can have is to be able to help their son, their daughter, to be able to understand that there is a God and that he loves them and that he wants to be their heavenly father and that he wants to fill them with his power so that they can face anything in life, anything in life, and to be able to explain that Jesus died for them and rose again, and he wants to come and live in their heart. You see, l l listen to me. A healing in America is not going to happen at a political level. It's just not. America will be at its best when the healing begins at the grassroot level. That's at my home, your home, in our church, in our communities. That's, that's where it's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen there, guess what? It's not gonna happen. 
And so that's why we want to raise a generation of people who know God and they want to make him known. Now, you may not be a parent, but I bet you you probably have a niece, you probably have a nephew. Maybe at your place of work, there's young people there. God wants you to be able to help them and love them and train them and teach them. You see, so what I'm talking about today isn't just for parents. It's for all of us who realize that we're not going to live forever here. And so if you're a parent, if you're a mentor, if you're someone who works in the next gen, you know, this is all for you. This is for all of us because there are people in your life who are younger than you, who look to you, that you have influence. That's why the proverb writer says this, teach children how they should live and they will remember it all their life. That, that's why one of the greatest opportunities, listen to me, one of the greatest opportunities for you and I is to be able to volunteer in our next gen ministry, to be able to teach a kindergarten class or maybe first grade boys or, or, or to be able to go to our, 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 our middle school or high school ministry and to be able to teach them how they should live. So they will remember it all of their life. We like to say that we want to drop an anchor, listen to me, an anchor of hope in them so deep that they'll never, ever, ever, ever recover. And so the proverb writer says, teach children how they should live. Why? Because they don't know how. And they will remember it all their life because they're impressionable. Do you, do you listen to me, do you realize that by the time a child is 13 years of age, they have already formed basically who they're going to be and what they're going to believe. See, that's why it's such a great, great investment. So what do we want to teach them? Let me give you four things, okay? Their spiritual identity, authenticity, character, and greatness. Now, why do we want to do that? Well, look at what Proverbs has to say. Teach children how they should live and they will remember it all of their life. And so we want them to remember these four things all of their life. So let me help you with it today, all right? The first one is their spiritual identity. And here's what we need to understand. Listen, we are more spiritual than we are physical. And this is hard for our physical and mental selves to process because we're always dealing in the physical. But if you don't understand that we're more spiritual than we are physical, you will miss this mark. And you will make sure that your child has food and clothing and equipment for their sports and maybe for their music and for other things, but you will miss the most important thing, and that is their spiritual identity because that's how they function. And so what happens is this. As parents, if we're not careful, we can want to live our dreams through our kids, right? You know, I was an athlete, so I want my kids to be an athlete. Or we can want our kids to what? Experience what we didn't. And if we're not careful, these things can feed consequences with their future and their future with us. You see, here's what I believe. We all basically have the same basic needs. All of us want to feel loved. We all need to be loved. We all need to have a purpose in our life. We all need to have a strong hope that, that will carry us through the ups and downs of life. And here's what I want you to know. Though we may not be dialed in on these things all the time, there is someone who is, and it's Satan. And he's always working overtime to disrupt and deceive your son your daughter, and he wants nothing more than for them to be destroyed so that what happens is they will, they will be content with superficial answers and that their needs will be met in superficial ways which will make them vulnerable to his attack and to life in general. And so we want to be able to teach them their spiritual identity. Let me give you three areas. One is security. 
Every child needs to know that they are loved unconditionally. They need to know that, that, that love is always there. They need to know that they don't have to earn it. They need to know that, that, that um, we will never leave them, we'll never forsake them, because they need to know that God will never. And when they experience it, guess what? They will feel secure, which is a huge, huge, huge thing in life. You see, God has purposefully put a void in each and every one of our lives that can only be filled with love. Love from him and love from you and me. And so we need to be able to love them so that they can have security. The second thing is significance. You see, everybody wants their life to count for something. And we wanna know that what we're doing has a lasting and positive impact on the world. And so that's why we encourage mom and dad, all of our high schoolers, to serve, to serve at our weekend service because this will give them significance. This is something that they're doing that will have eternal consequences. You see, listen, listen to me, dad. Listen to me, mom. We must paint a picture for our kids of how they can make a difference in their world in their family, in their church, in their community. Because if we don't, somebody else will come along and paint a different picture and will win their heart. And we'll wonder what happened to our son, what happened to our daughter, because they long for significance, just like you and I do. And then the third one is strength, is strength. We, we, we need to help them to understand that they have hope in Jesus, because this will help them to be able to preserve and, and, and to be able to persevere and to be able to, to go in life even when it's going against them. It'll give them an extra shot of confidence and courage. And we need to do that through our words and, and, and through our teaching. You see, what happens is hope gives us an incredible weapon and it gives us strength. It gives us strength. And this happens through teaching our kids to understand a biblical worldview, that, that there's more to life than just living and dying, that, that God has created an eternal home for each and every one of us. And this is only possible as we teach them a biblical world through great, or a biblical worldview through helping them to understand grace and truth. And if our homes are defined by fear, it's gonna be very difficult for your son, for your daughter, to have a sense of security, to have a sense of significance, to have a sense of, of strength and hope. And if our homes are defined by pleasing people rather than God, our kids will get a sense that they have to earn our favor, they have to earn our love, and they'll never experience the purpose and the significance that they long for. And so creating an environment of grace and truth means that we give our kids incredible freedom, freedom to be who they are. And that leads me to the second one, and that is authenticity. You teach your children about their spiritual identity, security, significance, and strength, but you also teach your kids about being authentic, being genuine, being real, and that is allowing our kids to be unique, and by the way, guess what? Even strange at times. You see, oftentimes it's those things that annoy you and me or maybe bring about some kind of level of inconvenience that are the primary ingredients that God has put in them that makes them unique, that makes them special because they're fearfully and they're wonderfully made. And so they are called to be genuine to have the freedom to be different, not to be like you, Dad, not to be like you, Mom, but to be themselves and to be who God gifted them and created them to be. And then we need to be able to help them to be vulnerable, to be vulnerable. Kids need to know that they have a safe place to talk about their fears, about their concerns, about their struggles, about their hurts, about their insecurities, about their relationships, and that we will never assess those things against them in dealing with our love for them or our provision for them. You know, and for this to happen, guess what? Mom, guess what, Dad? You need to be vulnerable with them. 
for your kid, for your son, for your daughter to be vulnerable with you, you have to model the way. You have to be authentic. You have to be genuine. You have to share your fears. You have to share your, your insecurities. You have to share your failures. And that'll teach them that it's okay to be able to do that and they'll experience a authenticity because they're vulnerable. You see, vulnerability makes you tough because it makes you allow to be who God created you to be. And then to be candid, to be candid. And this is so huge. Our kids need to know that they have the freedom to speak the truth. If, if you're at the Mason house, if you're at our dinner table, okay, all of our kids know that they have the liberty and the freedom to speak the truth and to be honest without costing them something with us. They're not going to be penalized. They can be truthful about their frustration with me or with Patty or maybe with the family, maybe things that we have done or maybe things that we haven't done, maybe that has hurt them or angered them or annoyed them. They have the freedom to be able to be candid with us. I'll never forget the time. I believe Sarah was probably about 13 years old, and, and my dad had visited us. And she came to me, and she said, Dad, you were rude to Grandpa, and you need to ask him to forgive you. And it took me back. And, and, and I told her, I got defensive, okay? And I told her, I said, I don't think I was rude. She said, you were rude and you need to ask him to forgive you. And you know what? When truth comes, it doesn't matter who it comes through, does it? And I felt the fact that I needed to go to my father and I needed to ask him to forgive me. And that's what I did. And I told her, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna go see grandpa and I'm gonna ask him to forgive me. You see, we, we need to be willing to hear the truth from our kids. We need to give them permission to speak truth to us. And when they do, we need to be prepared to eat a lot of crow and to ask for a ton of forgiveness. Because I believe being a great parent requires a lot of humility. And so we want them to be authentic. And for that to happen, they need to be vulnerable. They need to be candid. And then... There needs to be an environment where you can make mistakes. It's not a question of whether our kids are going to make mistakes. They're going to make mistakes. It's just a matter of when and what. And they need to know that there's nothing that they, listen to me, they need to know that there's nothing that they will ever do that will separate us from them, that we will always love them. Because they need to know that they have a heavenly father who loves them and that nothing can separate them from his love as well. You see, the home is a place of where mistakes can be made, even big ones. Ready for this? Even embarrassing ones. E e listen, even ones that make the paper. But it should, ne listen, it should never end a relationship. Never. I've told my kids, listen, there's nothing that you're going to do that will ever cause me not to love you. Because I want to teach them to be authentic, to be genuine, to be vulnerable, to be real, to be open, even about making mistakes. And then the third area is character. We need to teach our children about their spiritual identity, about authenticity, and about their character. Character, as one writer says, is defined in doing what is right as God has defined what is right. Wow. It's the ability to live in reality, it's the ability to embrace the truth and the discomfort of truth, of what you're dealing with, what you're facing with, doing the hard thing, the uncomfortable thing, not because it's popular, but because it's right. You know, we've always heard, you know, it's what's on the inside that really counts. That's true. Good character is what compensates for weaknesses it redeems brokenness. It increases your potential. It gives you favor. And yet we live, listen, we live in a society of where we appear that it's more important of how you present yourself than who you really are. We, we live in a society of where 
what happens is we'd rather people think that we're right than to be right. And too often, if we're not careful as parents, we, we go for focusing on behavioral modification. We go for the fruit instead of the root. And so we never address the surface, we, we never address the real issue. We address the surface issues. And what we must do is we must focus on the heart. And if we get the heart right, then guess what? The character and the behavior will follow. And so we must determine and we must desire that our kids turn out right more than look right. So we must build character in them so that they can have strong, healthy relationships, so they can be that spouse, so that they can be that parent that God wants them to be. And it paves the way for them to be able to be followers of Christ that make a difference in their world. They become thermostats instead of thermometers because they're living out their faith. So how do we do that? Let me give you a, a number of ways. One is faith. And what is faith? Faith is believing that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he has promised to do. And so what happens is when faith becomes a character trait, we begin to make moral choices that are aligned with God's word. So faith. The second one is poise. Is poise. A keen sense of appropriateness, of what is appropriate. Poise is that moral and relational equilibrium, okay? It's God's grace in a person's life that allows them to understand what is right in a given situation. You see, Ecclesiastes tells us that poise is basically knowing when to plant or uproot, tear down or build, weep or laugh, mourn or dance, embrace or refrain, search, or give up, keep, or throw away, to be silent, or to speak up, or to love, or to hate, or to go to war, or to make peace. You see, poise is doing the things that you need to do when you need to do them, so that you can do the things that you want to do when you want to do them. Poise. Poise. And then discipline. Discipline. If we're going to teach them character, it's discipline. You know, foregoing the immediate, okay, so that we can enjoy the prize and the reward. You know, it's like railroads beneath a, a train. The discipline that, that we build in our sons' and daughters' lives that enables them to harness their gifts and their talents and their personalities that God has built into them. You see, someone might say that a train track confines the train, but in doing so, guess what it does? It empowers them to do an enormous amount of good for people and for the marketplace. And a train that leaves its rails is called a train wreck. And train wrecks are messes. And so are the people's lives who don't have discipline. And so we must love our kids enough to be able to do the hard work of building discipline in their lives. And so let me ask you a question. Do you have a routine in your family for maybe dinner? Do you have a routine of where you come together and, and you have devotions? Do you have a routine of where you, you, you have chores that each person in the family does. You see, you want to be able to develop character, and you do that through discipline. Let me give you this last one as we wrap up, and that is greatness. That is greatness. You see, the world measures success by what? Wealth, beauty, power, fame, possessions, all of those things. But you don't have to read very far into Scripture to find out that more times than not, God uses the weak, the broken, the unknown, the undesirable man or woman to do his best work. And so if we aim our kids towards worldly success, we're definitely aiming too low. Success is like pop. You drink it and it tastes good but it doesn't satisfy you. We're longing for significance because God has something better in mind. 
And so we don't want to just be successful when we can live out a significant life. And the greatness is a passion for God, a love for God, to be able to do his will, to be able to follow his plans. Because listen to me, I tell my kids this all the time. When you are convinced that God is wiser than you, it's gonna be a great day in your life. And God has ordained the days for all of us to walk in. And we wanna teach our kids and we wanna be able to lead our kids in that. And leading our kids to reach their God-given potential. And how do we do that? How do we do that? We speak to their heart. Because Proverbs says it this way, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So we speak to their heart and we wanna develop three types of hearts to be able to lead them to greatness. One is a humble heart and that is reverence for God and respect for people. We wanna develop a grateful heart and that is appreciation for what we have. To, to, to be able to be thankful for what we have, to focus on what we have and not what we don't, and to be able to thank the giver of that. And then a generous heart, a generous heart, one that is delighted in sharing the resources that God has blessed them with, which is basically being a servant. And so I want to challenge all of us to be able to be intentional because everything that I've mentioned here will not happen by accident. It'll only happen if you and I, as parents and as leaders and as mentors, have the desire and the discipline to be able to see a bigger picture. Now maybe you grew up in a home of where you didn't get these. You, you didn't get the spiritual identity, you didn't get the character, you didn't get the authenticity, you didn't get the, the, the um, the truth that I'm sharing with you today, I wanna to tell you that God wants to give that to you. You have a heavenly Father, and hear me on this. This is one of the reasons why we meet every week. Every week, because your heavenly Father wants to train you and wants to teach you in these four ways of being able to understand your spiritual identity, your authenticity, your character, and your greatness. By the way, guess what? These are the four things that we teach in, in, in our, our, our grade level classes and our, 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 our junior high and our high school classes. And we want to partner with you on that. And so today, what happens under your roof is more important than what happens any other place. And I wanna invite you to be a part of God's family and allow him to train you and develop you so that you can be able to influence and impact your world in a positive way. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you today for your love for us. We thank you for the opportunity to learn and grow. And God, I pray for every mom, every dad here today. We have an incredible responsibility and yet at the same time, an incredible privilege. I pray that you would help us to be able to be trained and developed by you through the power of your spirit so that in return, we can teach our kids their spiritual identity. We can teach them character. We can teach them how to be authentic. We can teach them what it means to be great in the truest sense of the word. So be with us. Help us to be able to live out this truth. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dwight, for another great message, and I hope that spoke to you today. Hey, listen, it's through your generosity and God's faithfulness that we're able to do this, that we're able to bless others. And so I hope that you'll consider partnering with us on this mission. There's four easy ways that you can do that. You can give online, you can download our mobile app, you can text to give, or you can give at any of our physical locations across Northeast Ohio. And as always, we would love to see you there. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, to keep up to date on everything that's happening at Newpoint. Hey, it's been another great week and we hope to see you next time.